I've been a wild rover for many a year. I spent all my money on whiskey and beer. But now I'm returning with gold in great store. I never will be the wild rover no more. And it's no name, never. No name, never. Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Ireland. These lands, as in countless others, have experienced war, disorder, and civil unrest. These conflicts have resulted in deep-rooted divisions among the people, especially within Northern Ireland's Protestant and Catholic communities. Even though the fighting has stopped, there is a long road ahead of healing and reconciliation. However, the arts can hold a key position in aiding in the peacemaking process. The arts can be used in integrated peacemaking programs to bring divided groups together. However, certain art forms work better than others. These art forms can bring about transformations within people and conflicts. Nevertheless, there are certain characteristics within arts peacemaking programs that bring about lasting change. Finally, memorials in public art play an important role to unify people after a conflict. The arts are a powerful tool for bringing about change. In the words of Tom McGill. Art, creativity. Because creativity is dangerous. Creativity is new. You're creating something that didn't exist before. Whether that's a relationship, whether that's a, a poem, a song, you know, whatever it is, uh, it's something that didn't exist before. In this creation of something out of nothing, the arts can bring individuals together. At Brandeis University's International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life, their Peace Building and the Arts program conducts research on creative approaches to peace building in an arts setting. Their research spans from the study of Irish modern dance as a tool for peace building to the study of playback theater as a resource for reconciliation to even engaging the arts as a way to promote coexistence. Research like this is paving the way for more practical applications of the arts in the peacemaking field. During my travels of these countries, I interviewed numerous individuals about their views on the role of arts in the peacemaking process. These are their voices and their stories. The arts come in many shapes and sizes. Every art form speaks to an individual differently, and some work better in peacemaking programs. All the individuals I interviewed believed in the power of the arts to bring people together across social identity differences. However, each brought their own preferences on art forms that worked in bridging these gaps. Here are some of their thoughts and stories about the arts and their power. There's still a lot of Protestant and Catholic relation problems in Glasgow, so I guess the art, that's, so there's a lot of funding from the Scottish government that go into a lot of projects and educational projects to try and build on these divides, and usually arts is used a lot. And also, and I was involved in the Just Festival last year in Edinburgh, which is like, it's grounded in having conversations and using the arts to bring about peace and education and understandings of social justice, so... Yeah, it's, it's really powerful, and that's why it's really painful that people don't give the arts the credit. Dance. I consider dance one of the um, uniting and celebratory forms of art where everyone's just moving with their divine expression and honoring each tradition, how we all move through the world, unites us all. And when we realize our unity and our, um, it helps to recognize um, that oneness, that humanity that courses through all of us. In the prison where I work, I spend a lot of time walking about, loitering with intent. And I remember walking through an art class. And then the next week I went back to see the same art class, where the men had been calm and quiet and really interested in what they were doing. Um, some of it they kept, some of it they were allowed to give to children to take home. Um, the second week, I went to see 
the same class and found it had been cut. They'd cut the class because they said, the prison authorities said, there was no end product, there was no exam, there was no qualification at the end of it. Uh, so they didn't want to continue it. So in my little way, I thought, what can I do? And I went, I decided I would go in at the weekend on a Saturday and I asked permission and they said, yes, I could have the whole of Saturday morning with a group of men. And I called it an activity, art and prayer. Mm -hmm. And I um, collected the men at 8.30. We read a Bible story, a text of some kind. And I, I, I chose a theme for each week. For example, one was transformation. I read them the story of Jeremiah going to the potter's shed and the potter working with clay. And when the pot went wrong, he started again. I wasn't allowed to take clay into prison. That's, yeah. that's a hazard because the men could model keys from that. But I did take in some Iona stones. Um, I was really impressed when somebody showed me an Iona stone with um, a wave of green serpentine going through it from Columbus Bay. The person explained to me that the green serpentine had once been mud, dirty, slimy mud. And over millions of years, it had transformed, transmogrified, I believe is the geological term, into green serpentine. And with the men, I talked about how God wanted to transform our lives and change, change us from something like mud into something truly beautiful. So we would um, have, a, have a, a Bible story and I'd have visuals on the table and then invited the men to respond with paints or felt tips. Um, and there was no resistance. They all tried. They all wanted to do something. They felt moved to do it. So that's an example of my little attempt at uh, taking art into prison. I personally think the most successful part of that is the ability to establish a personal connection. So I tend to respond more to theater or more to music performance because those people are there, which is different than perhaps graphic arts, visual arts, where you're, you're, you see the piece of work, but not the artist behind that. And in theater and music performance or in dance, you're experiencing the art and the person at the same time. And I think if you're looking at how do we further global understanding, how do we further peacemaking, which starts with creating goodwill and breaking down barriers and establishing some type of, of a personal connection. Just as Brian expressed, theater and music were the most popular options for a peace program. For acting, there are numerous organizations that choose to use theater as a platform for change. Some such companies are the Smashing Times Theater Company in Dublin, Ireland, the Educational Shakespeare Company in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Playback Theater of the United States, and Shakespeare Behind Bars in the United States. During my time in Belfast, I had the pleasure of meeting Tom McGill and Kristen Kearney of the Educational Shakespeare Company also known as ESC. This organization works with the imprisoned, mentally ill, and other marginalized groups in the theater and film context to transform conflicts. Here is Tom's story of ESC's early work. So we started first of all doing work in schools, working with young people using the Shakespeare text, like Romeo and Juliet, to explore people's conflicts, cultures, and communities, basically, to, to use the play, uh, the story of Romeo and Juliet, to, uh, to examine that. And, and we, we would ask the young people, so if this story was happening today, where would it happen and who, who would the Capulets and the Montagues be? And of course they told us, well, one side would be Republican, one side would be Loyalists. And so we, then we began a debate. And, um, and so we would use Shakespeare as a way 
to work with communities, to bring them together. We would work for the Catholic school, Protestant school, bring them together, explore those issues through the, through the work of William Shakespeare. And then, um, and that was very successful. We did that for a number of years. Um, and then 2003, we were invited to apply for a grant. There was a substantial size grant uh, that meant that part of what we had to do was to evaluate the work using film. They said, we want to record it. So we said, oh, great, that's wonderful. We would love to do that. And so that's what we started doing. First of all, we started using film to record the impact of what we did. So we would interview people. We would talk to them about the process of you know, what they'd been through. And then um, we would use that film as video evidence, essentially. And, uh, and then we thought, well, do you know what? We actually quite enjoy making films. And we started using film more and more on our work. And then it convinced me. I thought, yeah, we must, we must use film more. In addition to ESC's work, several other individuals expressed their faith in theatre as a peacemaking art form. Well, I think when it comes to certainly theatre, um, there should be no divides. Um, I, I think the arts are great for, for people of all different races and sexes and uh, nationalities and uh, sexual orientation coming together. And you're, you're coming together to, as an ensemble piece, uh, everyone working together to create something. So something that might be perceived as differences outside of the arts world don't, you know, are, they're not important. Then within a performance or within a piece of work that you're creating, the arts can be a super vehicle to highlight these issues. And because I know I'm involved in educational theatre myself with children and, and healthy eating and exercise, so they can be a, a powerful tool. And I think people are safe then as well, audience members are safe to ask questions afterwards and, you know, if it's in an educational uh, setting to, to ask questions and they can bring up topics that people can discuss afterwards. And and really, when you're, I suppose, when you're experiencing the medium of film or theatre, you, you can you can think and you can discuss it afterwards. So it, it's for, uh, as a vehicle for discussing. Drama is all about uh, telling a story. Uh, and usually drama involves stories that people can identify with um, regardless of their their background, because there are usually some common themes. It could be themes like um, love, or it could be themes of belonging, or ambition, or betrayal, or and so uh, the story can really be identified by people in all cultures. So I think theater is especially powerful. First off, there's the immediacy of theater. So you are, you are right there near the stage in a very intimate environment. So you're an observer or a part of the audience, but in a way you feel as though you're a participant. So there's an immediacy behind theater. Secondly, depending upon the nationality of the playwright, you may be getting insights into American life or into British life. Could be comedies, could be drama. Um, and I think the... The transcendent nature of theater is such that much theater speaks to different dimensions of the human condition. So a lot of the impact of theater is the universality of what is performed and how that speaks to people's individual lives. I think the interesting thing with theater compared with music performance or dance um, is the language itself. And language for for anyone really is access to another culture. So the language as the medium for a greater understanding, I think, is also very significant. There was only two performances. We went to the first, and it was in an empty warehouse, and it was a mixture of professional opera singers, professional actors and actresses, and a number of disadvantaged people who might have had learning difficulties, might have been homeless, etc., and it was the same theme, it was the passion. And when it started, there were some massive doors on one wall of this warehouse. And the doors opened and this truck backed in. And it was a flatbed truck, but it had canvas sides. And it parked up. They took the sides down and the caster inside and they got changed on the truck. And then basically created the set around the building. It moved. We just walked around with it. 
But what was interesting was the disadvantaged people, some of whom had been in trouble, drugs, alcohol, had some of the speaking parts, but they weren't able to do 70 minutes of speaking. So there were eight Jesuses. So somebody was Jesus for 10 minutes, and he or she had a blue shawl. And at the end of their little spell, they passed the shawl. So I passed the shawl to you. You became Jesus. And we got that early on. But it had taken two years for the drama to be created and evolved and be rehearsed and then to show it. And at the end, they were absolutely euphoric that they'd got through it. It had gone really well. We'd really enjoyed ourselves. We received it or we applauded for ages. And it was such an example of the arts getting across, you know, over a, ba- over a not so much a barrier, but you know what I mean, being shared and people being able to sort of use skills that they didn't know they had. So the playing field was level. It didn't really matter what their problems were. They were performers. And that's how the, that's how the audience, there was about 400 in the building. That's how the audience accepted it. Many put their faith into music as a peacemaking art. The International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life at Brandeis University conducted research entitled The Rhythm of Reconciliation. This research focused on the usage of drumming as part of the reconciliation process in Burundi and South Africa. They approached drumming as a form of nonverbal, rhythmic dialogue that is a universal language. During my research, Individuals discussed similar unifying natures of music and its communities. Depending on the type of music, of course, but a lot of more popular forms of music come inherently with a very strong subculture, such as like you know hip hop and like uh, rock music, and uh, you know a lot of like mainstream pop and what have you. So when these like communities form, um, they're kind of bonded over their mutual love of a certain style of music. And so in that way, these can be very accepting communities. Um, And that can uh, certainly be a way of bridging these gaps between um, different nationalities and ethnicities and all the rest of it. You know, you you go to music festivals across the world and you see people just engaging with music that's being performed. And regardless of who they are, they they feel a, a connection because of that. That's not to say there aren't problems within those subcultures, of course, but the music it can be a big uniting factor. As well, like, you know, performing music, because you're interacting with people in a very emotional and creative way. I feel like creating music with just with people is a really good way of uh, bonding with them. The work of famous pianist and conductor Daniel Berenboim came to surface during discussions of using music as a tool for peace building. Specifically, his work involving music education within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. His best-known project is the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, which is based in Seville, Spain, and consists of young musicians from numerous countries in the Middle East. Daniel Berenboim and Edward Said founded this group to bring together both Arab and Israeli musicians, regardless of political divides. During my travels, I met with Hope College Board of Trustee member Brian Gibbs, who spoke of his thoughts of Daniel Berenboim's work. His work over the years has been to, to bring Palestinian musicians, other Arab musicians, and Israeli musicians together to form one orchestra. And because they need to play well together, they also need to interact with each other and get to know each other. So I think depending upon how the interaction is structured, it it can further understanding and be a contributor to peacemaking. Personally, I feel that both theater and music are wonderful art forms for peace building. Music and theater have shaped so much of my life in positive ways through my involvement in band, orchestra, choir, musical theater, and radio. I have truly been inspired by Tom McGill of ESC Kurt Toflin of Shakespeare Behind Bars, and Daniel Barenboim's work. I had the pleasure of working with Kurt Toflin during Hope College's production of Sweeney Todd in 2012. I found his approach to the theater process profoundly introspective 
and creative. In April 2016, I attended a viewing of the Shakespeare Behind Bars documentary, followed by a talk back with Kurt Toflin. Through these works, I was able to see the transformative power of the arts. The arts can transform individuals and conflicts. Through my travels, I heard countless testimonials to the arts' power to change people for the better. Here are three stories of transformation from Tom, Jane, and Lloyd. I fell into theater by accident. I, I'm a, an ex-prisoner, um, and it was in prison that I met my enemy. And, and so it was meeting my enemy in prison that had the turning point in my life. It um, reintroduced me to my own humanity again. And my enemy, even, even though he was dying, he was, he was on a hunger strike. And um, even though he was dying, he convinced me to get into education and not waste my life in prison. And so listening to somebody who's very close to death has a very profound effect upon you. <clears throat> so, so I listened to him. Um, his, his name was Frank Stagg, and he died on hunger strike in prison. And he was an IRA volunteer. So that was a major turning point in my life that switched me on to education and the power of education to transform lives. And then when I got out of, out of prison, I went and got involved in education. And one day, uh, there was another guy who said to me, I'm going for an audition. Do you want to come? And I said, well, what's an audition? And so, uh, so I went along, and uh, the, the playwright and the director were there, and they gave me a script to read because the other actor hadn't turned up. So I read the script. I said, wait a minute, I'm not an actor. And uh, he said, oh, no, just read this. And so, so I read it, and it was about hoodlums. And what was I in prison for? Violence, being a hoodlum. That's why I was in prison. And so I thought, I can do this. You just want me to be a hoodlum? That's easy. And so they went, oh, that's really good, you know, <laughs> because it was lived experience. I had the lived experience. And then I discovered, wait a minute, the buzz that I used to get from, from being a hoodlum, stealing cars, robbing. Suddenly I could find it in the theater. Suddenly that same buzz was, was available legally. And so that's how I got into it. But when I was there, I had a complete and utter moment of clarity that I knew that I believed. I've been a churchgoer for many years, but I've always been a bit of a doubting Thomas. But I just suddenly had this complete and utter moment of clarity. I can't tell you why, that I suddenly knew I believed. I stopped doubting. And I found myself singing a Hebrew blessing to the others in the group, only one of whom may have been a practicing Christian. And given that there was at least two Muslims and in the group, it was received with a lot of love. I remember watching the movie Gandhi. Um, I remember being emotionally moved through most of the movie, but by the very end, uh, it was really quite transformative because there was a... Uh, a real sense that not just me, but everyone who had watched it for the very first time felt connected to each other by the power of the story. Uh, the story of one man being able to uh, move an entire nation, not through war or not through political machinations, but through uh, love and integrity and persistence. In addition to the arts, there are certain characteristics that make such arts-based peacemaking programs successful, especially ones designed for children and young adults. Here is some insight about why youth programs are particularly successful. Hatred and uh, prejudice is very much a learned thing, depending on the age of the children and how much they sort of have learned from their, uh, their parents or relatives. Children don't have biases, they don't discriminate. The fact that uh, children can come together and work together and from all different nationalities and, and, and areas and religions, of course. And then you might give them a safe environment as well to ask and to learn. 
and it would be fantastic and they're having fun as well and they're all integrating together and they see no differences with each other and he, do you know what he could when, when, when something like that then would be put on like for example the orchestra and adults would maybe sitting there watching this going on thinking do you know we've a lot to learn maybe from children in addition to what we can learn from children here are some other ideas about what makes arts-based peacemaking programs successful uh, integration with people from all sorts of different backgrounds so it's like if you're allowing it just basically allowing anyone to come along just to have the experience regardless of well, I suppose race and or talent <laughs> letting people have a go and find their feet the need to work together and in working together getting to know one another because the more you know other people the more you realize that we're all the same what leads to conflict is because we're frightened of what is different if we know that other people actually aren't different then we're not frightened of them and that reduces conflict. With equal status, that everybody's making a contribution. How, you know, how can you say, uh, this is what you need to do? If actually you've got no experience of being in that situation. Having a social side to it, so that the people can actually socialise with each other, but also having you know, a really compassionate person who's leading it, who can also talk about in a kind of humorous and light-hearted way the similarities between the two groups of people and how more similar they are rather than different. Acceptance of every student for who they are, mm -hmm. not expecting them to be something in particular. Being able to identify uh, the gifts that each person brings, even if they may not be readily evident be open to whatever uh, gifts might be lurking under the surface in every student. Finding the right sort of vocabulary to talk about these things is very important because, and, and like taking an interest in what the children want to create, not what you want to have them create. I certainly felt growing up, if we're talking about children, like, you know, from five to 12 or even a little bit older, um, I certainly felt growing up that I was extremely talked down to. And for the longest time, I had absolutely no interest in music um, because I thought there was no, nothing of interest for me. And it took a very long time for me to actually get invested in it. I think I would have felt a lot more invested in it if I'd, first of all, like facilities and resources to allow children to create things using a medium they want to use it's very difficult to let the, the kids be engaged without allowing them to do what they want to do because i mean kids learn best of course when they choose to and when they are invested in learning the thing overall the most important characteristics were having a safe open place where these groups can work together equally Tom McGill of ESC shared that honesty, transparency, accountability, accessibility, and a non-judgmental environment aid in a successful peacemaking process. According to Acting for Peace, there are key success factors that result in a successful peacebuilding program. These include artistic integrity, significant and designed participation, artistic risk-taking, the usage of non-art spaces, principled leadership on artistic and behavioral standards, the company's understanding of the complexity of the peace-building process, the longevity of the work, and individuals with strong personal commitment to both peace-building and the arts. This research was conducted in the Irish context using the case study of the Smashing Times Theatre Company. Personally, I believe youth hold the key to the future. Youth art programs, especially in theatre and music, allow children to form relationships with other children of different backgrounds. A key aspect to forming long-lasting peaceful relations between diverse groups is interpersonal relationships. The arts provide a place where people can grow closer together by working to create something new. That is why art is so powerful. It is the coming together of people to make something out of nothing. And that is truly beautiful.
In addition to these programs, public art and memorials can have a significant impact about how communities move forward after conflicts. In Belfast, the murals and memorials to the dead can be quite divisive amongst the Protestant and Catholic communities. These public displays of the past can keep these hardships close to the surface. Here are some examples of such disruptive displays. So um, where I live in Mournview, we have a big mural with the Loyalist Volunteer Force. And um, so they're one paramilitary group. And then the other side of town would have the IRA. So um, it doesn't really bring us together. For a long time, um, Ulster have been against the IRA in the other way. And we fight all the time. And um, it's basically like gang signs, you know? So you see this and you know where you are and in my my estate where I stay in Mornview and um, the Loyalist Volunteer Force is um, a guy with a balaclava holding two AK-47s bang right in the wall it says in God we trust Loyalist Volunteer Force to, to be honest um, whenever I see our murals I kind of feel like I'm in a safe place but if I see theirs which is just the same then I know I might be in danger I don't like them, but that's the way they make me feel. I think during the, the Troubles in Northern Ireland, and these still exist, but on the side of some houses, like at the full gable end, it will be something depicting either the IRA or the UDF, or whatever they're called. Mm -hmm. So, and that, they are still there. But um, the stuff in, in Belfast is different from Banksy. It's all sort of a glorifying the conflict but I would say that from where I'm coming from. I'd say it's not really helping that for us to get over this. But they are living together now. There aren't really haven't been any serious bombings in the immediate past. They are ruling in, um, in the parliaments in Northern Ireland. Shared, shared power, power sharing, that's what they're doing. However, monuments can be part of the healing process especially when they are designed by individuals from both sides of a conflict. Here are some ideas about what makes unifying memorials and public art. I think it helps to remind them of the cost of conflict. I think it helps to remind them that often both sides have lost things that they would, or people that they would have preferred not to lose. So it reminds us of what conflict is about and why we should avoid it. Yeah, I think it's very important. I think it's really important to remember um, stories that are often not remembered um, historically and certain groups that are often repressed and that memorials... I mean, memorials often don't actually show those groups. Like, war memorials don't usually consider the refugees that happen during war or consider women during war. But I think more and more we're becoming to... Well, I hope the arts are being used to provide memorials for groups that are often forgotten in conflict and in peace building and in therefore remembering them or remembering other the other side of the war is really important for, for peace giving so understanding that war is you know it's not a one-sided thing and there are always casualties on both sides and there are always there's always two sides to a conflict or three or four but mm -hmm. I guess memorials are important to remember and hopefully create I guess a better understanding of the different sides. I think it depends on the the way that the memorial's designed and if it's all encompassing and welcoming for all the different groups because there is a risk that it could be uh, it could isolate certain groups and make them still feel not included in the new society after a conflict. So I think um, there can be pros and cons to that. The Duke of Wellington statue is particularly uh, adored by Glaswegians because it universally has a traffic cone on its head, uh, a big orange traffic cone. The police kept taking it down, but it kept being put back up, and now it's a permanent fixture, pretty much. I certainly feel that the cone represents a very Glaswegian sense of humour. Glaswegians are very aware of um, what our city is and the way it's been for many, many years, um, but we're very proud of it. And we love its very strange character. Uh, it was really nice to see Glaswegians come together, especially in a city that has been historically so divided. Personally, I feel that public art can play a central role in unifying people after a conflict. 
If individuals from separate groups can come together to create a public art piece, such as a mural, it could become a daily symbol for the efforts of peacemaking in that area. For example, if people in an area of Belfast do not like a violent mural that exists in their neighborhood, it could become an intercommunity project where citizens from Protestant and Catholic backgrounds could create a new, beautiful mural in its place. As seen in East Belfast Mission, the children have hope for the future of their city, which they illustrate through their art projects. I see the world through the arts, and through them its brokenness can be made whole. The arts are an essential part of culture, which tie us to the human condition. Every person experiences the arts differently and uses them in their own way. Some of us use them to express ourselves and work through the pains of the past. Others use them to experience new cultures and lessen the gap of our differences. The arts can even be used within our faith to express a love for God. I have personally used all of these at different points within my life. My journey of life has been wrapped with music and theater, since I used them to connect with all people. I loved meeting all these wonderful individuals as I traveled from country to country and sharing in their story. I truly hope I can continue to share in others' stories in all my future endeavors. My journey of Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Ireland may be over but life always has a next great adventure.